Our second reading is from the book of John. We're reading in chapter 12, verses 20 through 33. Listen for the word of the Lord. Now among those who went up to worship at the festival were some Greeks. And they came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and they said to him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew, and then Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. And Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their life will lose it. And those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me. And where I am, there will my servant be also. And whoever serves me, the Father will honor. Now my soul is troubled, and what should I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it is for this reason that I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. And then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. And the crowd standing there heard that, and they said that it was thunder. And others said, an angel has spoken to him. This, my friends, is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains just a single grain. Fred Rogers tells a story or told a story about preaching. And it's a story that always made me feel good because it reminds us that ultimately preaching is, the hands, is in the hands of the Lord. So the story goes like this. Mr. Rogers was with two of his friends and they were um, at Sunday worship. And the preacher, who I hope wasn't my friend, but uh, the preacher, Fred thought, was doing it all wrong. Now, Fred was not that long out of seminary, so he was full of the information of seminary. And he kept thinking all during the sermon, well, they're not doing it right. This should be happening this way, and they should have done this, and this really is poor quality, and if I were grading it, I'd give it a C at best, you know? But on the way out the door after the service, he noticed that one of his friends, the wife of a married couple, was crying. And she put her hands on Fred's arm and she said, wasn't that just the most wonderful sermon today? It really, it really spoke to what I needed to hear. And Fred realized that preaching wasn't necessarily in the words of the preacher, but in the receptive hearts as well as the words, was something that God had charge over. I was in Oklahoma this week, central and northwestern Oklahoma. Actually, I was in northeastern Oklahoma too, but um, I spent the week in Oklahoma, and this is the season of winter wheat. If you've never watched winter wheat grow in the Midwest. They plant it late in the summer, the end of August, the beginning of September, so that the fall rains will water it and it will sprout. And it makes the most beautiful grass. Wheat grass is absolutely gorgeous. It is so green. It's like that shirt right there. <laughs> 
It is bright Kelly green. In fact, people who've been to Ireland tell me it's the same color that Ireland is. You know, it's that gorgeous green color. And in Oklahoma, they put cows to graze on it because why waste the perfectly good grass, you know? And then as the winter comes, the snow comes, it gets covered with snow if you're lucky, and then the snow slowly melts as the spring comes. And then that grass grows up again, and it's again that beautiful color. And there I was in the middle of March, driving through Oklahoma and seeing fields and fields of wheat grass. <coughs> Now, by the middle of March, they've taken most of the cows off of the grass because it's time for the hollow stem to grow. And that's the thing that puts out the head of wheat. That cycle of wheat growing and then ripening and turning the color of kind of dark toast. It's, it's not really golden in Oklahoma. I don't know, maybe some other kinds of wheat are. It's more like toast that's gone a little bit too long and then it's ready to harvest and you get a bountiful harvest if you've had rains in the spring. It's a beautiful thing to see and there I was in the early spring looking at this grass and knowing the wheat head was going to be up soon and I was there to bury our friend Cindy Pfeiffer Hill, because her brother had decided that they needed to do a service in Alva, and, and I understood that because Alva was where she lived for 25 years, where she taught school. Her professional colleagues were there. And so I went to celebrate her life and to bless her ashes. And Jesus says, unless a grain of wheat falls to the earth and dies, well, you know, Jesus is great at offering metaphors. And this is a metaphor for what represents a spiritual life lived according to the love of God and lived to be a blessing in the world. In the Jeremiah passage, it talked about the Jewish people having a covenant with God and that they had broken that covenant and the time would come when there would be a different covenant. God has promised to Abraham early on in the book of Genesis that he would be their God and they would be his people and they would be a blessing to all the people of the earth. And they would be a holy people, he says in Deuteronomy, because God is holy. And that connection, that promise between God and the people of Israel, it's called the covenant. And in the New Testament, at the Last Supper, Jesus offers his followers a new covenant. In 1 Corinthians 11, it says, for this is a new covenant sealed in my blood. And that's kind of where we are in Lent, right? We're thinking about that new connection between us and God through the blood of Jesus. But through the life and the words of Jesus also. It's not just the death on the cross and the bleeding and dying, it's also the teaching and the healing that Jesus did when he was among the people in Galilee and Jerusalem. Now the Last Supper in John is different, and I've told you this before, from the, the Last Supper in the other Gospels, right? In the other Gospels, you get a supper and you get that cup lifted up and you get that bread broken and shared. In the Gospel of John, you don't even get a supper. I mean, it's the same time frame, right? But what you got was the washing of the feet. You remember that? When he washed the feet of his followers. 
And Peter said, no, Lord, you're not going to wash me. You know, you're not going to act like a servant to me. And Jesus said, you know, unless I wash you, you have no part, no part of me. We get that foot washing and then we get these wonderful organic metaphors in the chapters that follow in 12 and 13 and 14. I am the vine, you are the branches, right? We are connected. That which gives me life gives you life. Or I'm the vine and my father is the gardener. And he would take and clean your leaves and prune what you need pruned away so that you can bear more fruit. Those are powerfully comforting, it seems to me, metaphors. That like a good gardener, God is out there taking care of us. Now, I'm nothing like a good gardener. My mother was the gardener in the family, and she was great. And I think I've mentioned this to you before. She was a wonderful gardener. <coughs> We had all sorts of things in our backyard that other people didn't have at that time, you know? We ate bananas off our own banana tree. There were flowers of every kind. We had a fig tree. We had an avocado tree that my mother grew from a seed and it had avocados on it. It was 25 feet tall. My mother was a great gardener, but you know, I got, I got black thumbs or no thumbs or something. My, my brother is a good gardener, but not me. I am not. But I understand the concepts of planting and growing. I know that the seed looks dried up and dead and goes into the ground and you water it and care for it and there is sun and in a few months time, there are wonderful ripe tomatoes. And if you're my brother, there's more okra than any five human beings could eat in three years, you know? And Jesus is kind of asking us to plant our withered selves. He's not asking us to get rid of the things that makes us us. This is a spiritual metaphor. It's not about whipping yourself or walking across glass or it's not about thinking that every good thing is a bad thing and you have to pare it away. That's not what pruning is in a plant. If you pruned away all the leaves, you wouldn't get too much fruit, right? It's about trusting that if you let yourself be planted by God, however God wants to do that with you, and if you let God tend you as the gardener, then you will bear fruit. It's not easy. It's not easy to think about being in a connective relationship with Jesus that the blood that flows through him, the life force that blows, that flows through him flows through you and you need to let that out into the world. You need to let yourself bear fruit. It's not easy. It calls you to live a life of paying attention. Paying attention to the needs of the world. And here we have a good attention guy in our, in our story. We have Philip. But Philip is interesting, you know. He's the kind of the in connection between the rest of the world and Jesus. If you, if you want to talk to Jesus, maybe you do good to talk to Philip. And he can get you in, right? Or you remember another place Philip shows up in the gospel stories? In the feeding of the multitudes. Jesus, when he sees that there are all these people 
and it's getting late and they're hungry because he notices, Jesus notices. He turns to Philip and he says, where can we get food? Where can we get food for these people? Because he figures Philip will know how to do that. Philip is a connection between Jesus and I don't know, other things that need to be done perhaps. In this story, he's going to facilitate the meeting of these Greeks with Jesus. Now, this happens in the Bible in that we talk about the Greeks and the Jews. And the Greeks are those people that aren't Jews. They can be all sorts of other things. It's sort of a generic name. And sometimes the Jew, these, some of these Greeks are called the God-fearers. Because there are some Greeks that are really interested in Judaism. They're interested in what the Jews believe and, and what kinds of things they do. And so they, they hang around synagogues. Sometimes they offer money to these Jewish communities. In fact, you can find old plaques in some of these old towns where there were Jewish synagogues that list the names of the contributors, just like we do in hospitals, you know. And sometimes they're really not looking like Jewish names. They're awfully Greek looking names, you know? So they contributed and they listened and they learned and some of them eventually converted. Some of them didn't, but they, they liked to listen to whatever wisdom there was among the Jewish community. And in this case, it's Jesus. We need to be willing to be connected to the world. Jesus says, unless you hate your life, which is kind of strong language, but he means unless you don't prioritize yourself as absolutely the be all and the end all. You know, you need to notice what's going on around you. Now, it, it's hard to have that kind of heart. It means that when you see a homeless person on the street, you need to actually care about it. Mm. It means that when your neighbor has needs, you need to actually think about what can you do to facilitate they're getting what they need. Not just offer thoughts and prayers, friends, although we all know prayers are awfully important. But what can we do to facilitate the need of our neighbors? Keeping your eyes open and staying connected. It means not turning our backs. And especially not saying words like, oh, they should pull themselves up by their bootstraps. That's what I did, right? as if we didn't ever have help. You know, I was born really smart. And so I got scholarships to schools that were really good schools. I didn't pull myself up my, by, by my bootstraps alone. I had help. Other people gave money into scholarships so that a person like me who came from kind of the lower middle class could go to a fine university and, and get a graduate degree, get a doctorate. And very few of us actually do it alone. If we're lucky, our neighbors, you know, offer help when we need help or our friends or people we don't know who fund scholarships in other places. Brian and I were talking this week about something that we'd seen on Facebook and it was a kind of a little short meme thing. Um, and it asked you if you could name like five, I would say Heisman Trophy winners. And some of you might be able to do that if you're really into football. 
or if several of them came from the university that you cheer for, you might know those names. And it asked you, could you name five Heisman Trophy winners? And, and I translated that because I'm more of a baseball fan to, you know, Cy Young winners. And you name five Cy Young winners. Can you name five people who won the Pulitzer Prize? No, I could look it up really quick because I know how to Google, right? In the old days, I knew how to use an encyclopedia or a reference desk at a library. But nowadays I got my reference material in my hand and I know how to Google so I can find any of those kinds of things. Can you name five winners of the Nobel Prize in Physics? And do you know what they actually got their prize for? No, because probably what they got their, uh, their prize for is not something we understand at all anyway. Although I can't explain Einstein's photoelectric effect, but many people can't. So I don't know about you, but I, I fail terribly at that. I, I can't do that. I can't name those people. But if you ask me, can I name three teachers who were important to me, right? Who did something that helped me along. I can name a bunch of teachers. Or scout leaders. Did you have a scout leader who was really significant in your life? I can name that too. Or maybe a pastor, if you're lucky. Not all pastors are good, but some are. I met with one of my pastor friends this week in Oklahoma. He's the um, executive for Cimarron Presbytery where I was um, preaching, where I pastored a church and was, is one of the best men I've ever met. And I know his name. Maybe a coach was somebody important for you. Or your best friends who always had your back. Those kind of things we could name because those were connections. People who helped us when we needed help. Maybe not in great big ways, but they were there for you when you needed somebody to sit next to you in the cafeteria. Or maybe you didn't have a friend then and you really missed that connection. We didn't get to have a memorial service for our friend Cindy here at New Hope, but we remember her. We remember her kindness. We remember that she loved to read. She was my next door neighbor in Alva and an elder in the church that I pastored. And whenever anything went wrong in the manse, because if you've ever known a manse, they're frequently old and things do go wrong. Well, she would invite me over to sleep in her spare bedroom or shower in her shower when I had no water. When she went to India with her family, she brought me back tea bags, tea from India. <laughs> she called me up and said, come over and have dinner with me. I brought you something. I remember her kindness and her willingness to bear burdens, encouraging this congregation, what, to give for school supplies for kids, right? For backpacks in the fall or Christmas boxes for the seafarers, right? Or just signing up to bring snacks after church. We honor her kindness by looking at our own lives and making sure that our own lives reflect this spirit. Next week is Palm Sunday. We're barreling quickly toward Easter. Lent is going to be over. 
take time this week to remember your connectedness to the other children of God. Look at your own self-centeredness and allow your own self-centeredness to die a little so that there can be a great resurrection and a full harvest in days to come. Amen. Amen. Today. Um, so I was at the Presbyterian meeting yesterday out at Clear Lake, um, and they shared with us about Palo Duro Presbytery um, and the effect that the wildfires have had on there. Um, and Presbyterian Disaster Assistance is actually collecting for them. Um, they said many farmers not only lost their wheat, thank you, um, but also lost the cattle. They burned up. Um, and so their livelihoods are, are literally um, tarnished. And I know that many of the Presbyterians around um, helped us after Hurricane Harvey. So I just want to mention that they are collecting for Palo Duro Presbytery through uh, Presbyterian Disaster Assistance. Disaster assistance. Um, if, if you go online to um, uh, pcusa.org, um, you can get a place where you can donate um, if you're so inclined. Um, I know. One of the heart-wrenching things, when there's a fire anywhere in the Midwest, uh, and grass burns, that's the food for the cows, you know? And the farmers who have wheat uh, bales of hay or whatever, um, put it on these great big flatbed trucks and truck it in big caravans to wherever that fire was, and watching the trucks go down the highway with these bales of wheat stacked all over the back is a um, 
It's a wonderful thing to see. Okay. Oh, I didn't do the thing, did I? Um, yeah, but what's the call per part? Lord, hear our prayers. No, that's what y'all say. What do I say? I, I need to go back to seminary. <laughs> I'm asking for prayers for my younger son, Tom Schilling. Uh, he's a chemical engineer, and he had said to me years ago, Mom, I'm going to be breathing in a lot of stuff, and I may be paying for it someday. Well, he said to me on the phone, the someday has arrived, Mom. Amen. Thank you. Lord, hear our prayers. I have one. Oh, good. Okay. My mother and my sister, Julie, both live in Amarillo. And while Amarillo has not been on fire, they have been affected by the smoke quite a lot. And they both are asthmatic. So prayers for them that uh, winds blow in the right direction to carry it all away um, and others that may be affected. My sister also lives right on the edge of town on the north side. So prayers that the winds are in the right direction and they don't carry the fire to her. Um, also, my friend um, <clears throat> Mary Jo Williams had a terrible fall about a week and a half ago and broke her pelvis in two places and she'll be in rehab for a very long time since her surgery uh, so prayers for healing and comfort Lord hear our prayers. prayers yeah especially I was in um, North Carolina last year when the fires were in Canada and even that many states down the air was hard and I'm not even asthmatic so I can imagine these people that live around that are having a terrible time so pray for breath okay yeah my uh, nephew has uh, suffered with diabetes for a long time one drug amputated, and he now seems to be in the last stages of his body just failing him. He may have a liver transplant, he may not. Uh, also, my next door neighbor, who comes and goes because he has two homes, uh, came in a few weeks ago and had a heart attack. Oh. Uh, I did a uh, procedure and he's at home waiting because they want the first procedure to heal and he will have another one next week. Uh, both of these he will need to protest. Lord, Lord, here are our prayers. Judy. Oh, yes, of course. Fresh for recovery for Lisa Walsh. Uh, who's hospitalized and for Patty and Sam. I believe we've been traveling to see her. Lord, hear our prayer. All right, friends. Um, I ask you to take a moment and uh, in the quiet of your heart, remember perhaps those prayer intentions that you have not mentioned this morning family or friend or situation and offer your prayers to God about that. Having offered the prayers of your heart to God, let us offer to God the prayer that Jesus taught his followers. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, 
as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. May our morning offering be an act of gratitude given from a grateful, loving heart. Thank uh you. -huh. 